This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. very much. Um, it is, thank you to, to Cheryl and Kate for the invitation to be here and, and to the One Health Seminar Series for making this possible. Um, I've been a devotee of the One Health concept for a long time and it's very exciting to see it beginning to take more form um, and cross-pollination happening across the health profession. So I'm very pleased to be here as part of this seminar series today. Um, so let me just kind of get a little bit of a feel for who's in the room. How many of you are veterinary students now? And how many faculty members do you have or staff? Very good. Excellent. And do we have anybody who's from the medical side of the campus, human medicine? OK. Thank you very much again. And I've got a lot of information to try and impart in 20 or 30 minutes for you, so I'm going to move kind of fast, but this presentation will be available for anybody who wants it afterwards. Um, I will warn you, it's not, it's not a dense presentation in terms of science, because that's not where I am now. I'm working at a much larger scale. I'm working at the landscape scale, and I leave the science more to experts, such as yourselves. Um, and I work at the bigger picture level, which is what I want to talk to you about today. So global climate change became very, very personal for me on the, second, uh, the, the first weekend of May 2010. And that was when we had a thousand year flood come through my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, and all through Middle Tennessee. And we had over 30 people who drowned in the state of Tennessee. We had over $2 billion worth of damage, um, a lot of it irreplaceable damage. Uh, all across the mid-state. It was an unprecedented flood event. Now, to be perfectly accurate, we always have to say that no one particular event can be attributed to climate change. But this type of flood event is exactly what's predicted by all the climate models. And as anyone who's been paying attention at all knows that all across the world, the physical changes that are happening across the planet are undeniable with floods, forest fires, melting glaciers. Uh, this group has been through the One Health Seminar. You know about climate change and the, the undeniable physical changes that are already happening. And you've heard a lot about the health connections, too. So this is um, where I work now. My main hat is with the Cumberland River Compact, which is a non-governmental organization, regional group that works in Tennessee and Kentucky. And we work for watershed stewardship, meaning protecting our water resources through protecting the land that surrounds the watershed. A lot of what I do is focus these days on sustainable building and policy and planning, which is certainly not what I would have thought I would be doing the time that I graduated from high school and I'm in college and vet school. Never in my wildest imaginations did I think that would be what I was doing. Um, and I'll talk, tell you a little bit about how I, how I got to that point. But these are some of the things that we focus on in terms of uh, protecting our water resources. And there's another one that's not up here, which is sustainable agriculture, which we are also beginning to work in uh, throughout our watershed. And the, the project that's directly climate related is called Climate Solutions University. And we have partnered, the Cumberland River Compact has partnered with a national NGO, the Model Forest Policy Program, to create Climate Solutions University. And it's funded at this point by the Kresge Foundation. Kresge Foundation is making an investment in climate adaptation experiments all across the country. There are over 35 organizations going after climate adaptation in various ways, and they're looking to see which approaches are the most effective and the most successful. 
So the One Health concept really is, for me, it's this simple. You see lots of different uh, definitions out there. For me, it's just this very simple, everything is connected. Um, and everything that you do in your learning and in your research validates that every day. That what happens on the farm, in the city, to the people or to the wilderness, it all interplays with each other. And the One Health movement is gaining momentum, I'm happy to say. Um, we have the AVMA has taken official One Health initiative forward. The USDA, uh, Department of Agriculture, has a 2015 project on One Health. Center for C uh, the CDC has uh, an initiative on One Health. Um, you all are probably very, very familiar. A lot of the people on campus are working with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the work that they're doing. Um, USGS and the National Wildlife Health Center, front and center on that, and of course, UC Davis is a real, at the, really at the forefront here, a leader in the One Health movement. You should all be very proud of that and feel fortunate to be part of it. There's also a growing recognition of the health impacts of climate change. And every day, new climate research, coupled with health research, is confirming that over and over. And you've had some excellent speakers here already that have given you specific examples about that. The uh, International Panel uh, for Climate Change has confirmed that. They did a whole chapter on human health. The World Health Organization is taking a strong stance on climate and health. Um, the director back in 2007 called it the most important global health challenge that, that the world is going to face. There was a, a landmark um, edition of The Lancet that devoted 40 pages to talking about the connection between climate change and human health. Even the EPA has declared that greenhouse gases are a, pose a risk to public health. So these are some of the diseases and disorders that you've heard about that directly impact human, animal, and ecosystem health. And for those of you who are not, um, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend being a regular reader of environmental health perspectives from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. Excellent resource on environment and health issues. From the IPCC, you may have seen this diagram, the, sort of the schematic of climate change and how it affects health through direct, indirect, and then the social and economic factors. And a lot of what you've heard about in the seminar series so far has been focused here, which is great. And this is where the research is needed. But this is, this is where I live and breathe now, is the bigger picture of the social and economic disruption characteristics and how those characteristics drive positive change. Because the truth of the matter is, no matter how good your science is, if society doesn't listen to it, and make the social and economic adjustments necessary, the best science in the world isn't, isn't going to be terribly helpful. So these are some, some of the key messages that I, I want to leave with you as we walk through um, these slides quickly today. First, climate mitigation. Who can tell me the difference between mitigation and adaptation? Anybody? Oh, come on. Somebody knows the difference between climate mitigation and adaptation. You're all shy today. OK. Mitigation is reducing greenhouse gases so that we reduce the severity of the climate change impacts. So it's about energy, transportation, reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases. On the other hand, climate adaptation is adapting to the impacts that we cannot avoid. And we're already at the point where we're committed to at least a two degree rise in global average temperatures. 0 0.6 degree rise has already happened. So it's not like if adaptation is going to be needed, we're already in it. We are adapting now as a species, as an ecosystem. It's happening now. And I like to call it a test kitchen. Um, we actually know a lot. There's a lot of good engineering and science behind mitigation. We know a lot about renewable energy. We know a lot about transportation. We have the know-how, really overnight almost, to change our emissions 
if we had the political will and the economic stability to do it. But the climate adaptation question, this is the one that is the real test kitchen. As, as the temperature rises in our test kitchen, as this burner is rising, um, we gotta figure out what this means. And I think that the One Health movement has a particularly critical role. If, if there ever was an issue where the health sciences, public health, veterinary, medical, nursing, mental health, and the ecological sciences all need to work together, this is it. So when I talk to students, I like to give just a real quick rundown of how I got to be where I am. Um, when I was a student, I would have loved to have known more about ways to use your veterinary degree in an alternative way. So um, I'll just give you a little bit of quick rundown on, on my history. Um, I graduated from Auburn University in um, 1980 with my DVM. But one of the reasons that I am here today uh, doing what I'm doing now is because I didn't get into vet school the first time I applied. I was number one alternate as a junior. Um, and so I, I had a senior year before I actually went to vet school. And it was in that senior year that I was able to take a bunch of ecology courses. And those ecology courses that I otherwise would not have had have led to a lot of what I'm doing now. I graduated in 1980. I had my own private practice for three years. And then I went back to school at Texas A&M and did a pretty traditional large animal medicine residency. Um, did my thesis work in pharmacokinetics and uh, went on to be a faculty member, equine teaching clinician at Iowa State University for several years. So this path, pretty traditional veterinary medicine. But all along the way, I was educating myself, following up on those ecology classes that had changed my mindset about the interconnectivity of everything, and learning about environmental issues, being a member of the Sierra Club, doing lots of volunteer work, learning about environment all along the way on my own. And then at one point, I left academia and took um, a, a, an exciting opportunity that you, you have the opportunity to do, too. And that was to go to the Washington and work as an AVMA Congressional Science Fellow. How many of you have heard of the Congressional Science Fellowship Program? Anybody? Just a few. This is a fantastic program. Um, it's, it's actually organized by AAAS, the American Association for the Events and the Science, and different professional societies send experts to Washington to serve as science advisors to Congress or to the White House. So I got to work for the Senate Environment Committee in the office of Senator Harry Reid. At the time, he was the junior senator from Nevada who knew he would end up being the Senate Majority Leader um, years later. But I spent um, a, a year working for the Senate Environment Committee, primarily focused on lead poisoning in children and also issues of rangeland management and feral horses in Nevada. So I worked with the university out there on immunocontraception on the feral horses in Nevada and rangeland management um, and a bunch of other diverse environment-related issues. I was pretty much a desk jockey, not unlike this lady here. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great skill builder, um, particularly writing, speed writing. And I'll, ne I'll never forget the first time I wrote a speech for Senator Reid, handed it to him, and he barely even looked at it before he just went out and gave it. And that's when I realized that, wow, this is powerful. And wow, these people really need scientist advice. Um, there's few and far between up there, this person who knows science on Capitol Hill. Um, so, really powerful program that any of you would be eligible to apply for once you uh, uh, have graduated. Following that program, I worked for the Agency for International Development for a couple of years. I got to run an environmental grants program and travel the world, visiting our grantees. Um, and as part of that, I also got to take the EnviroVet Summer Institute way back in 1983, when it was still just about aquatic ecotoxicology. But all of those things, or things I said yes to, and they shaped my future. So where I am today now is working with this NGO, putting on a Climate Solutions University program that I'm gonna talk a little more about, 
I'm also a volunteer presenter for the Climate Project, and I'm the volunteer director for a small nonprofit called the Alliance of Veterinarians for the Environment. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and these are sort of the one health hats that I think of myself as, as wearing. I want to talk a little bit about the connection between climate and water, because I think that's the crux of where a lot of um, health impacts come from and the impacts to animals and humans both is what climate is doing to our water resources. This is a nice diagram actually from the U.S. Forest Service, and it shows us the, uh, the particulars uh, about how climate is impacting water. So obviously in the coastal areas, we're getting saltwater intrusion and sea level rise. We're getting more evapotranspiration, which is leading to drier soils, changes in our uh, ecosystem from, from that. More intense storms and flood events. Um, that's part of this. The, more, the warmer the air is, the more it evaporates, the more is in the moisture is in the atmosphere, so the more intense the storms become. On the other hand, there can be less precipitation in certain areas as it dries out. You know that all over the world our glaciers are melting, and that's resulting in uh, more shifting of um, runoff to earlier in the spring and more flooding of runoff in the spring, followed by streams that dry up in the summertime that used to run year-round. Um, and this is true for both our uh, streams and our lakes. So first I want to just briefly touch on the One Health role and our role as medical professionals in mi climate mitigation. And I'm not going to dwell on this because this is something that most of you are going to be familiar with in one way or another. In, the, in our role as medical professionals, we touch on all of these things. This comes from the World Health Organization, but it's a good diagram for, for any health professional. Um, we touch on how agriculture is conducted, industry, especially the pharmaceutical industry, medical products. We touch on buildings, um, our practices, our hospitals, and the homes of our patients and, and owners. Transportation is critical to everything that we do, as well as just overall energy conservation. And finally, waste, especially occupational and medical waste. So the greening of healthcare is something that is actually getting some traction, and I'm pleased to say that. Uh, I would say that the medical profession is a little bit ahead of the veterinary profession on this, um, but the groundwork is there. There's a great green guide for healthcare that gives you um, detailed information about that for the hospital setting. We can also work to green our medical meetings, the medical supply chain, powerful force there, and organized medicine is beginning to have some forward momentum on the greening of medical um, practices. On the veterinary side, a couple of resources for you to know about. Uh, GreenVetPractice.com is a website that Tufts University Vet School has put into place. Uh, it's got a lot of really specific information aimed at the veterinary clinic. And there's a chapter drawn from that that, that just is in the brand new seventh edition of the uh, Zoo and Wildlife Animal Medicine textbook that just came out. The ABMA has a green team working on greening their offices of the headquarters, and they've got a One Health Headlines um, that comes out weekly on their website. Just to give you one example of a leader in this area is Dr. Matt Rooney. He has Aspen Medical Veterinary Services in Colorado. He and I co-presented at a conference of the American Animal Hospital Association. We did a three-hour workshop on the greening of veterinary practices, and it was a, it was a popular um, meeting that, that year. This is from his website, and his green clinic practices are front and center in everything that he does, and he gives back um, to environmental causes also as part of his practice. And it's been um, a hit with all of his clientele as well. And there are probably six or, or ten examples like that across the country. So there are leaders out there, but it's by far not the norm yet. There's a long way to go. So climate mitigation then can include all of these things that we as medical professionals can have an impact on. And community leadership is one that's really particularly important, and I'll touch on that one a little more when we get to the adaptation side. So adaptation, on the other hand, is this, um, this test kitchen 
how do we adapt properly? What are the right choices to make now so that we control the diseases that are increasing? So that we control and, and mitigate for um, the violence that occurs from the storms and the sea level rise? Well, we're approaching that through one, one experiment that we're doing is through Climate Solutions University. And our goal here is to bring climate resilience to rural communities where the natural resources are, our focus being on forest and water. So we work with rural communities across the country and help them assess their risks and come up with adaptation strategies that, that protect the habitats and the ecosystems where they live. And this is particularly important because two-thirds of the water supply of the U.S. comes from forest cover. This is the Climate Solutions University team. Uh, we're a virtual team. We're scattered all over the country. I'm in Tennessee, and most of these guys, but several of them are out west. Some of them are in the northeast. So we work in a virtual environment. But this is a, what we focus on, that two-thirds of our water comes from forested habitats, and 15 to 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions are caused by deforestation. So just by changing the deforestation practices, we could cut out greenhouse gases by as much as 20% overnight. Um, this diagram um, shows that uh, uh, these are numbers, I think, from 2009. 6.6 .6 billion tons of carbon dioxide were released. And of that, almost 2 billion tons of it could have been um, sequestered through reforestation efforts. So this is. Protecting our forests and water is no small matter when it comes to addressing climate change. So these are some of the many steps that we could take to adapt our forest and water resources. Basics of watershed stewardship, protecting where our water comes from. Where does the drinking water come from here in Davis? You can tell me. Is it well water? Is it groundwater? You're lucky. Um, that's, that's always cleaner than surface water, so that's nice. Um, emergency preparedness is an important piece of that, preparing for all of these impacts that are already occurring, and then being part of a low-carbon economy in various ways. So we know what some of the strategies are. And this diagram about um, uh, the repairing zone of a stream sort of reinforces that. Well, with a stream, what's really important to protect that water resource is that you have a vegetated riparian zone or stream bank zone. Um, the Center for Watershed Protection research shows that if every stream had a 300-foot protected vegetated zone on both sides of the bank, um, almost all the other problems would go away because that would be enough to filter and clean and protect that water resource. Most of the places don't have anywhere near that much protected zone around their streams, but that would be the ideal. So the watershed approach then, which is what we use um, at the Cumberland River Compact, is all about mimicking the natural hydrology of a site. We want to maintain the forests and the buffer zones, as much habitat, and then treat the land so that the rainfall that falls is infiltrated and filtered down through the ground into the groundwater and then reaches the streams through the underground base flow instead of running off rapidly with all of the surface pollutants with it. And so these are some of the tactics that get us there. Um, planned growth, low impact development, green building, these things that are um, very well understood. So to put it simply, the goal is to make this, with full of houses and parking lots and roads, behave in a rainstorm as if it were this. So we want the rain to filter in, to be clean, and not run off rapidly. And curbing deforestation is a key part of that. And it takes land use planning to get there. And that happens community by community. So we put together Climate Solutions University as a distance learning program aimed at rural communities who needed the help with land use planning and understanding their climate risks and adapting. And our main goal is to have an actionable local climate adaptation plan 
that they can act upon over the, next, over the coming decades to protect their natural resources and have a healthier population uh, and a healthier economy. So these are the four steps that we take our communities through. First, they form a local team, and that local team is a diverse set of stakeholders, and it's, it's a mixture of uh, government agencies, universities, um, politicians, teachers, business owners. There's a wide diversity of, on that team, and that's what makes it successful, is having that broad stakeholder input. However, well, one of the things that I'm always encouraging is a health, having a health professional on that team. And I'm here to tell you that that is the hardest person to get on a local team. They can get a, almost anything else as a volunteer to come work on their team, but to get a, a physician or a veterinarian or a nurse or even somebody from their local public health department, that's the hardest get for them is to get their time and their attention. Then we take them through um, an, an assessment process where they do their risk assessment uh, related to forest, water, climate, and economics, and then they develop a local strategy that works for them. And then we help them support um, implementation over the next coming years. So I'm going to give you just a quick run through of some of the communities that we've been working with. Um, so to date, we've had 14 communities go through the program all across the country. These are our 2010 communities that we've been working with. And these are their faces. And they are true community leaders that have taken on this challenge. So I'm going to give you just a quick snapshot of some of the things that they're doing. First, the Mountain Studies Institute is a research organization up in the Colorado mountains. And some of their key findings when they did their risk assessment had to do with catastrophic forest fires. That was their number one risk, and they have already been occurring there. Um, they also have a drastic changes in stream flow and early melting of snow, particularly, leaving them without water supply in the summer harvest month. Um, they're also seeing shifting in vegetation. The habitat of the mountain pika is going away. The, the pika has already migrated as far upslope as they can, and they're gradually going extinct. And then their tourism economy is also going away. So their solutions have to do mainly right now with the, with the fire threat. And they put together a firewise campaign to all the landowners and to the Forest Service to help prevent these drastic fire, forest fires. And there's a lot of science that's going into what does that mean? What are the best forest management practices that are going to pre prevent those forest fires um, saving the habitat and all the species that live there. And they're engaging at, at the local level also with research and planning along those lines with their local government. The next one is the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association. They are a nonprofit up in Washington State, and their mission is to save the salmon. It's that simple. And the salmon, despite decades of help, is still slowly going extinct. So some of their key findings have to do with changes in the stream flow, especially early snow melt and runoff, followed by poor salmon reproduction and the consequences to their forest health overall and the economy of the region. So her approach um, is to, they've, they've launched a massive education campaign. They're working with both the city and the county on adaptation planning, and they're doing massive riparian enhancement projects all up and down the watershed. So um, these are just some of the activities that they're doing. Um, they had a symposium on climate. Over 150 people came. They held um, streamside habitat restoration projects. They planted nearly 10,000 trees and they've had a significant input into the adaptation plan of both the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County. And the, the last one I'm gonna talk about is Sumner County, which is in my home area. This is Sumner County, Tennessee. 
Um, their key findings, of course, were flooding. They were part of the massive flood that happened in 2010, along with droughts and storms, heat waves. They've had um, a measurable uptick in waterborne diseases there, and, and particularly just population growth. It turns out that where we are in Tennessee is where a lot of population is going to come to from the coast. As they predict that sea level rise drives the population inland, Tennessee is going to be ground zero for a lot of population growth. So a lot of the strategy here is to be prepared for that. And they're, because they are a county government, they're going after the policy solutions with stream bank ordinances, tree canopy ordinances, and steep slope ordinances. And they're using stormwater regulations from the EPA as the tool to get that done in an otherwise very conservative climate that wouldn't want to have that done. So some of that has already begun with, um, we held a, a training for planners and a lot of education and outreach is already happening uh, related around that. And in fact, as we speak, uh, probably the stormwater, one of the uh, repairing buffer ordinances being considered this week. So um, these are some of the, thanks. These are some of the, um, I can't read this from up here, so I'm going to have to do this. Um, these are some of the adaptation strategies that we know how to do, right? We, these are not much different than good watershed stewardship. Um, and these are things that now have a new sense of urgency about them. So adaptation is really taking the form of education, policy, and restoration for all of these communities. And I could, talk, I could give you 14 stories about this, but I'll, I'll spare you that. We are working with six new communities this year, and these are their faces spread across the country. And this is the map of where our communities are across the country. So at the end of 2011, we will have 14 communities all across the country that have been through this process. And not only are they helping uh, improve the habitat and the health of their local community. But from a political standpoint, this is having an impact. These people are all talking to their elected officials and sharing with them their findings about climate changes that are already happening, not projected out in the future. This is already happening right now. So we've learned a lot of lessons from these communities, and we continue to learn. As, as I said, this is an adaptation test kitchen. What are the right species to be planting because the, trees, the tree species there now are not surviving? What do we do to handle the waterborne illnesses and the algal blooms that are happening in the rivers and streams? How do we manage the transmissible diseases from humans and animals and back and forth? These are all questions of adaptation that are out there for classes like you to research and understand and guide the future as adaptation goes forward. Um, I was going to ask, and we'll save this for the question session, but I want to hear from you why you think it's so hard to get health professionals to be involved in this sort of community engagement. And I just want to make a couple of suggestions about things that you can do related to community leadership wherever you are. Um, there are opportunities through organized veterinary medicine. You can become an advisor to your local elected officials. You can be become part of an NGO and, and focus your research on these questions as well. Um, also, for the profession as a whole, I'm very encouraged by what the One Health is doing to connect people, and I hope we see more of that. I would love to see ecology and conservation as a prerequisite to both medical school and veterinary school. Lots more community projects as part of what you do in school and just overall being an advocate for the One Health approach. I hope that one of you out there opens a true family practice somewhere that is a veterinarian and a physician and a counselor and a nutritionist all housed in one place and that family can come there for everything that they need for their health needs. So climate change is the great challenge of our generation. It can become a unifying force in an otherwise very divisive world that we're living in right now. We do know how to solve a lot of these problems. It's a matter of will and doing it. 
and we ha still have a long way to go in terms of learning how to properly adapt. Leadership, your leadership, those of you out there who are coming into your own now are key to this. So these are the three messages that I started out with. Um, we know what to do with a lot of mitigation. Adaptation, we're, we're learning as we go, and One Health has a critical role to play in this. I'll finish with just with this quote. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that is exactly what the One Health approach is doing. So thank you very much, and um, I will turn it over now to, um, to the next speaker, and we'll take questions at the end.